It's July the 12th, 2021, and coming up on this week's episode, uh, we will look at Formula One, some little bits of news coming out there, but mostly looking towards the British Grand Prix and how sprint qualifying will work as it makes its debut in the sport. We'll look uh, across the ocean to NASCAR and IndyCar. We'll look at the World Rally Championship, uh, the World Touring Car Championship, supercars in Australia, and a whole heap more all coming your way this week on this week's episode of This Week. Hello then folks and uh, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to this week, thank you so much uh, for your continued support and for coming back. Please do hit that subscription button, it means an awful lot to uh, to me and to this channel. Um, and as I said, I really appreciate all of the views. Now let's uh, get things started uh, by looking at Formula One and of course the, uh, the really sad news uh, this week that uh, Formula One legend Carlos Reutemann uh, sadly passed away. The Argentine who so nearly emulated his countryman uh, Juan Manuel Fangio uh, by becoming an Argentine F1 world champion just narrowly, narrowly missed out uh, on a couple of occasions. He was an emotional, sensitive racing driver who uh, on his day was, could be uh, and was one of the, the finest of his or any generation, and you think the time at which he raced, the, the mid to late 70s, early 80s, there were some great drivers, and on his day, Carlos, Carlos could be the best. Uh, he raced for Brabham, Ferrari, Lotus, Williams, and cemented himself as a, an absolute legend of the sport, would become a politician on retiring from Formula One, um, elected governor uh, in his homeland. Uh, he will be very, very dearly missed. Carlos Reutemann uh, was 79 years old. So to this weekend and looking at Formula One and the kind of the debate, I guess, post Austria about in-race penalties, defending, attacking, what's allowed, what's not, what's right, what's wrong, that will, I'm sure, continue into the British Grand Prix with discussions sure to be had between the drivers and the FIA with uh, Michael Massey saying over the week that um, he didn't see any need to change the way in which everything was regulated, to change penalty points in particular. But a discussion I'm sure will be had at Silverstone. Um, something which looks set, as I said, to continue into this weekend. Uh, the Grand Prix at Silverstone will feature for the first time a sprint race qualifying procedure. Uh, now I've already made a video previewing the British Grand Prix, but a quick catch up on essentially what will happen there is that we'll have Friday practice, then into qualifying as we would normally have on a Saturday afternoon, three part qualifying, then Saturday morning, free practice two, Saturday evening, we will then have a sprint race, 100 kilometers, about 30 minutes in length, the results of which determine the grid for the Grand Prix itself on Sunday. Pretty simple, right? Uh, three points for the winner of the sprint race, then two, then one for second and third. Normal points for the Grand Prix on Sunday. Now, I know one of the big questions is, how will Park Ferme work? How will the tires work? So the tires. You're only allowed two sets of tires for FP1. In qualifying, then, on Friday evening, five sets of soft tyres will be given to every driver. In Saturday practice, you're allowed to use one set of tyres. Teams get to decide which one. And then in the sprint race, you get to use one set of tyres, which you can determine. The two remaining sets of tyres are your race tyres for the Grand Prix, and the teams are able to pick their starting Higher. So there's still a little bit of strategy, still a little bit of decision making that can be sort of gone into over that weekend. Well, quite a lot actually. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the teams determine that. Park Ferme will be in operation from after qualifying on Friday night. So no changes during or after FP2 or after sprint 
qualifying. Uh, again, back to Michael Massey, he said that if things don't quite work out, he's open to keeping an eye on things, changing the sporting regulations just to zhuzh it up a little bit, but it's gonna be really exciting to see how this sprint qualifying format works. Max Verstappen, meanwhile, this week has called on Red Bull to redouble its efforts uh, to ensure that its domination isn't just limited to that amazing weekend or two weekends in Austria. The team having stated that its push for the championship in 2021 won't affect its chances in 2022. Red Bull has also put the kibosh on Aston Martin getting their hands on their new technical director, anytime soon. Dan Fallows will have to work at Red Bull until the end of his contract in the middle of 2023. Formula E now, uh, who had a double header in New York City over the weekend. Uh, the guys arrived in torrential rain, massive storm, high winds, which pretty much cleared up for some of the weekend. Uh, cleared up long enough, certainly, for Nick Cassidy to grab pole position for race one as Edo Mortara massively struggled, the points leader qualifying last um, after running on reduced power during that session. The race itself saw Cassidy and jean eric Verne actually collide during the contest, uh, handing the win to Maxi Gunther, Verne coming home second, Degrassi third, Cassidy just off the podium in fourth. Race two looked like it was going to be an all Jaguar affair. They absolutely swept the front row. Bird on pole, Evans alongside him. But in the race itself, what had looked being like a, a pretty, I'm not going to say easy, but a pretty assured one two ultimately was not as Evans just tagged the wall, damaged his car, and dropped outside the top 10. That left uh, Cassidy in second, getting to the podium that he was denied in race one with Antonio Felix da Costa coming home in third. The win for Sam Bird. I should have mentioned he won. He won. Sam Bird won the race. Um, the win for him sees him fly to the top of the driver's point standings, five points ahead of da Costa and Robin Frines, who are tied for second. To NASCAR now and a brilliant race between the Bush brothers saw Kurt come out on top beating uh, his brother Kyle to the win in Atlanta for Chip Ganassi racing so soon after Chip announced he would be leaving NASCAR. Um, he's therefore secured himself a place in the playoffs again. Uh, the brothers swapped the lead pretty much all the way through the race, the only pause coming when the track started to break up. Luckily, the track is due for a resurface and a bit of a reconfiguration and I think most would agree that's long past due. Denny Hamlin still leads the point standings, although, as you will know by now, still hasn't won a race. Still hasn't automatically qualified for the playoffs. Kevin Harvick in ninth is also yet to rack up a win uh, as those playoffs draw ever closer. Couple of little snippets from IndyCar. Road America will be on the calendar for the foreseeable future after inking a multi-year extension, which is great news for that fabulous and historic circuit. Uh, meanwhile, the post-mid-Ohio test seemed to go really well, particularly for Tatiana Calderon, who tested for Foyt. The team saying she now very definitely is on their list of potential drivers for 2022. In the World Endurance Championship and IMSA, uh, a joint bulletin, joint news from the ACO and IMSA confirmed that Le Mans hypercars will be able to run and compete for top honours in IMSA from 2023. The four key areas of tyres, acceleration, aero and brakes were all agreed upon by the ACO, IMSA and the FIA, which opens up crossover potential for the future, gotta say just sounds absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. In the World Rally Championship news during the week of a 2022 calendar, a preliminary 2022 calendar consisting of nine events. The FIA and WRC have said that it could go up to 13, but at the moment they've got nine locked in. It'll start again, as it always seems to do, in Monte Carlo before moving to an all-snow event in Sweden. Uh, the Safari Rally in Kenya is back on the calendar for another year. Wonderful stuff, as is Croatia. That's become a very firm favourite. Finland, Arctic Rally Finland, Greece, Estonia, Spain, Japan, 
Portugal, Italy, and Ypres in Belgium are also on that list of nine confirmed races for a preliminary calendar for the WRC in 2022. WTCR time now, and Gabriele Tarquini took the pole, the win, and the fastest lap in race one at Aragon, as Frederick Vervish did exactly the same in race two. To jean carl Vernet leads the standings on 82 points as the championship moves to Monza at the end of the month. In the European Le Mans series, Panis Racing took its maiden win at Monza with Will Stevens, Julian Canal, and James Allen. Not that James Allen, not the commentator James Allen, the racing driver James Allen, uh, beat United Autosports after the four hour race. Uh, great stuff then from Panis Racing taking, as I said, their first victory in ELMS. And in Aussie supercars, Shane van Gisbergen was back to his early season form in Townsville, taking both victories, denying Jamie Wincup. Uh, van Gisbergen, of course, leads the championship. He is pretty dominant this year, um, doing an absolutely stellar, stellar job. And uh, yeah, showing once again that when he is on form, he's pretty much unbeatable. Well, there we go then, folks. A slightly quicker, slightly shorter version of this week for this week. Thank you so much as ever for tuning in for your continued support. Hit that merchandise if you want to. As we always say, uh, it's very much appreciated. And of course, a percentage of every sale goes to charity. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next week for the next edition of this week.